hard to believe it's been 21 years, isn't it? I don't know about you guys, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to go there today, but uh, I can remember vividly where I was <clears throat> that September morning, and I can remember now, as I look back, how God used the circumstances that were unfolding uh, in that moment, in that season, to um, kind of do a course correction with me. I probably had been wrestling with God for a while, and uh, I was uh, in a senior executive role in the secular world, and pretty shortly after that, transitioned to the nonprofit world, which was God's uh, stepping stone for me as He called me in the ministry. <clears throat> um, 21 years. So, today, before we open God's Word, which I'm extremely excited to do, I just want to remind us who in here can smell? Most of you. I can't, is the reason why I have to ask, but so the reminder is one that's already in the room that we're going to have an opportunity to break bread together after service today, which is part of the way that we worship. And uh, I saw some interesting crock pots back there, so I hope that you're looking forward to that. But before we feed on physical food, we're going to feed on God's Word this morning. Uh, we're in part two of En Christos, which literally means in Christ. And today we're looking at this interesting phrase. I'm going to focus in on mystery of God's will that Paul talks about. And I wonder, have any of you ever had a conversation with someone when they had so much to say that you literally have a hard time trying to like be a part of the conversation? It's like the conversation is coming at you like a fire hose. And you realize that as they start to talk, that the excitement level in what they're saying is heartfelt. I have a relative, and now that Judy's out of here, <clears throat> that will remain nameless, not Judy, um, that sometimes when I have conversations with her, particularly on the phone, like even just saying goodbye sometimes can take 15 minutes. I mean, she just is very excitable, and she has a lot to say. Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, and in particular what we're going to look at today, um, we see some spurts of that. What we're going to look at today in chapter 1, picking up in verse 3, these 13 verses that we're going to look at, it's literally in the Greek one long continuous statement. It's almost as if Paul, who was so caught up with emotion and what he's about to tell us about the wonder of God's work that he just couldn't pause for a breath. There was no punctuation involved here. He simply couldn't stop. We needed to hear what Paul had to say, and I hope that today we can receive it the same way that he spoke it. Because when we consider all the theological issues covered in this prayer, we can understand why he was so excited. Let's stand with each other, if we could, in agreement to God's word this morning. We're going to pick up in verse 3. Um, it is going to be on the screen, but I'm just going to warn you, shortly after we read it together, I'm actually going to ask you to look either in your physical Bibles or on your phone, or maybe you have chapter 1 of Ephesians memorized by now, however you do that. But we're going to look at these 13 verses. You're going to need to actually see it. So if you want to take this time now to find it, that might be helpful. Picking up in verse 3, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to praise to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. To be put into effect when at the times when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who are 
the first who put our hope in Christ might be able to praise, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Let's pray. Father, we come this morning and uh, there is so much in your word. There's so much just in this handful of verses this morning. Lord, we just ask in this short time span that we have that your spirit would work in us that your spirit would be my interpreter this day, that you would hide me behind the cross and that you would speak clearly into the hearts and minds and lives of your people. Lord, we thank you for your faithful servants who recorded your word and those who kept it from then until now that we might have it this day. And Lord, as we dig into it, we openly ask that it might dig into us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So this long sentence in Greek encapsulates this wide range of Pauline theology. And it's all through the lens, as he opens in verse 3, of spiritual blessings. Paul writes about God's work in Christ. He talks about the plan of salvation. He talks about a repeated emphasis on God's sovereignty in the midst of that plan. The recreation of all humanity as a result of, as a result of Christ's redemptive work. The forgiveness of our sins, our adoption as God's children, and the confirming seal of the Holy Spirit, all in just a handful of verses. And in the backdrop to all of it, we see God's sovereignty. Everything is accomplished according to God's perfect plan for God's will. But what I want to go to is right in the heart of what I read, what is this mystery of God's will that Paul mentions in verse 10? It's at the center of this long sentence, and it's at the center of the meaning of what he's talking about here today. But before we go there, since he talks about spiritual blessings, I want you to look at someone on your left or your right and let them know that you're blessed by them being here today. Paul, interestingly, because he does a lot of focus in other texts on the plan of salvation, in this particular passage, he's not as focused on how salvation has come to be, but he's more focused on who gave it, God, and to whom us, all of humanity. But also, and this is the part that I want to zero in on, he also focuses on the end to which it is being offered. Paul calls us to this mystery of God's will. Paul gives us some foundational truths. He talks about God being the one who saves. He talks about the reality that God acts through Jesus Christ. He talks about this magnificent thing that we know of as salvation. He talks about the Holy Spirit's presence in this being the final evidence that the work that God wanted to happen in us has been accomplished. But it's hard, honestly, i got to tell you, it's hard to read this prayer and not feel a special grace of being human and having spiritual blessings poured out on us. I hope that you sense that and feel that this morning. Again and again, the text manages to emphasize God's unique love and concern for us, the masterpiece of His creation says in verse 4 that he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We were the plan all along. He created all these other things and then put us at the capstone of that. God marked out a plan for our adoption as his children, it tells us in verse 5. God's glorious grace that he freely lavished on us, it talks about in verse 6. And then in verse 7 and 8, it talks about the reality of the riches of God's grace that he so freely pours on us. Indeed, Paul begins this whole prayer, though, on this note of excessive blessing. Every spiritual blessing in the 
heavenly realms. God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The heavenly places referred to is part of the timeless eternal realm where the Spirit of God dwells and where we're invited into. Reading these verses, I hope this morning that you begin to get some sense of it. It's kind of a daunting task, if I'm honest. As we step back and look at what Paul's saying here, it's, it's as if Paul starts talking and he starts talking about all these physical blessings. And the reason why I believe he doesn't use a comma is because Paul is so enraptured with the fact that God pours out so many blessings on us. It's kind of like searching for the correct number of squares in one of those embedded square puzzles. You know what I'm talking about? Like where there's a square inside of a square inside of a square and you look at it for long enough and you finally, your vision gets all blurry and I don't know, maybe that's just me. Only the spatially talented can finally get to the bottom of that. Only the particularly gifted can arrive at the correct answer there. But when we look at verses 3 through 14, and I want us to do that. If you've not read through Ephesians, do it. But start today just by reading these verses again when you go home. What you begin to realize is that there's blessing upon blessing upon blessing. They're interconnected like Russian nesting dolls, if you will. So here's the part I was talking about. I want you to read the text right now, and I'm going to pause for just a minute. I want you to look at your Bibles or your smartphones, or like I said, if you got it memorized, that's awesome too. You guys are tough. I have one little half laugh out of that. I want you to count the blessings. I want you to seriously come up with a hard number. Tell me how many blessings you see in these short number of verses. I'll give you just a minute. Anybody got a number? Infinite. Any other numbers? Not that infinite's wrong, just asking. We can all have opinions, right? What do you see there when you count them? Hard number of blessings that you count in verses 3 through 14. I see some pencils going. What do we got? A couple more answers here. Got to hear from somebody else. What else we got? How many numbers? How many blessings? How many? 23. Good number. Anybody else? How many? 13. I didn't hear that last one. Wasn't loud enough. 19. Sheila's going with the pencil here. She's going to give me a number in just a second. Okay. A lot might argue. I'll wait and see what we get. Yeah, there you go. I should have planned on that. Do, do. A lot of people will make an argument that's somewhere between maybe 15 and 28, right? I'm not going to give you a specific number. Keep counting. Look at it again later when you get home. Here's the reality, though. It really is like one of those interconnected things because the reality is that it's not just the obvious ones that he states. He's very purposeful in the way that he states things. He uses illusion. He's saying a thing that you'll see on the surface, but when you pray about it and look at it, especially with the one right next to it, you might find another. 
It deals with God's plan for the world. He talks about it in verse 10 as being the mystery of God's will. This is his eternal plan. And it says that we receive it all through these spiritual blessings that he pours out on us. Let me give you seven that I am going to just point out. And that's absolutely nowhere near the totality of them. But I think these are worth looking at. He tells us in verse 3 that God's great blessings are spiritual, that they're heavenly blessings. He tells us in verse 4 that God has chosen us to be holy and blameless. I don't know, just those two alone should somehow shake you into some kind of different state than when you walked in this morning. God has created a plan to adopt us as His sons and daughters. It talks about in verses 5 and 6. It talks about this reality that He's established a way to redeem us. I don't know if you, I mean, we throw that word around a lot, but it literally means to be welcomed into God's family. We're joint heirs with Jesus. It's not just a word. It's a critically important word. He talks about the blessing of being forgiven for our sins. And we're only down to verse 8 now where it says that he's given us wisdom and understanding as one of the spiritual blessings that we have. He's given us this inheritance. He's chosen us. We are part of the chosen. We are grafted in. And I love verse 14 where it tells us that we've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. That's just seven kind of big surface ones. And I got to thinking about it, that exercise that we just did where we count on perhaps maybe blessings aren't intended to be counted. Like I know that we used to do that to go to sleep. I don't know if your parents ever did that, but that was something mom would ask us because I was like, didn't want to go to sleep. To go count our blessings as you fall asleep. Counting our blessings, especially the ones that are bestowed on us from God, is at some level absurd on the surface of it. Counting our blessings makes about as much sense as trying to count the grains of sand on the beach or the number of hairs on our head. Now I get that last one's easier for some than others. (laughs) But the idea is that they're limitless. What God pours out on us as blessings is limitless. Yet, tracking and counting is what we do as humans, right? We not only count our blessings, but we like to count the blessings of the people around us just to make sure that God's taking care of us as good as our neighbor sometimes. We wonder why maybe I'm not quite as blessed as they are. And sometimes, unfortunately, what counting blessings leads to is that we also maybe have a sense of counting our failures and the insults against us. The good things and the bad, they all get numbered. It's like we have this giant balance sheet that shows all the experiences that life brings our way and we try to hopefully stay somewhere in even or at the very least maybe a little bit in favor of the blessings. I think as humans, it's natural that we itemize blessings. But we get the feeling as we read Paul's words here, and he lists a bunch of them, that what he's trying to do is open our minds to what Dave shared, is that it's infinite, it's unlimited, that the blessings that we receive from God, we can never put a real number on. It's beyond what we can ask or imagine. But in 2022, at the end of two years of forced isolation, with so many things in our lives changed so much, some of us, if we're honest, maybe even just for a moment, find it hard to count those blessings. We forget quickly. In seasons of challenge, in seasons that have difficulty in them, we so quickly forget the unlimited blessings that God pours out upon us. And there's a couple of reasons why that's sad. One is because the blessings 
enable us to worship with a whole heart, but the other is because the blessings that He pours out on us are not just intended for us. They're intended to pass through us. We're intended to be a conduit church. Those blessings that we receive, we're to pass out to our family and our friends and the hurt and lost people out there. The people that you can see it in their eyes when you interact with them. You can see the pain just by having a conversation with people. Let's not forget whose we are and how blessed we are. I get the last few years have not been easy for anyone. Because honestly, it's not just one thing. It's kind of several people have referred to it as the three-headed ogre. Yes, there's been the pandemic, but there's been some nasty politics. And then in the midst of the two of them, we also saw racism rear its ugly head. It's like this fire-breathing monster that wants to destroy our happiness. And so I just ask, I just don't take offense, I'm just saying, is it possible this morning as we sit here, that like the ancient Israelites trampling through the wilderness, that maybe we've lost sight of the blessings that we have, that are still ours, that are still real, that are still tangible, because we are His children, we are called by His name. And instead of creating a culture sometimes maybe of complaint instead of maybe sometimes being a people or a body that takes offense and sometimes maybe instead of lamenting what's gone by let's live in the reality of the moment that we're still his and that we still have unlimited blessings amen we need to get used to feeling blessed because god's not going to stop blessing he wants us to live in it he wants it to saturate who we are. And I get it. Like I, I have conversations regularly with people that, that tell me about like a different day when they felt on fire, but for some reason they're in this place where maybe they feel the thrill is gone. And I have to ask, what happened? Did God change? Did he limit the blessings that pour into our lives? Paul's letter to the Ephesians is a much-needed attitude adjustment. We've already noted some big blessings that Paul identifies in this letter, but before we go on much further, we need to talk a little bit about this word blessing. Because grammatically, blessing can be both a noun and a verb. Used as a noun, I might say something like, Judy is such a blessing. Or Burton is a blessing. Or Grace Lee has so many rich blessings, nouns. But the word can also be a verb, conveying an action. The pastor blessed them and sent them on their way. Many of you will bless children around the world by bringing in gifts and participating in Operation Christmas Child. They'll receive a blessing from you, although they may never meet you this side of eternity. And to go directly back to our source text here in verse 3 this morning, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. You caught it when we went through. Is that something I'm doing? I don't know if you caught it as I was going through, but Paul uses it both ways. Paul is talking about a blessing here, not just as being something that is tangible, but as being a blessing. The point is that it's something that we can both receive, a noun, but it's also something that we can and should bestow, a verb. We can receive a blessing, and then because of that, we bless others, we we see people that are in a place that they don't necessarily want to be, and we have an opportunity, church, all the time to reach into their lives and to be a blessing to them. Sometimes it's just a kind word. We were talking the other night at the home gathering, and sometimes it's just helping them know that they're not invisible. We live in a culture, we live in a time when a lot of people operate and think and feel invisible. Sometimes just making eye contact with them and letting them know that they matter and that you notice them. Be a blessing. 
be a blessing. But still the question lingers. What is the mystery of God's will? This isn't some abstract treatise. And this isn't only for certain exceptional people to understand. This is a letter written to people just like us. It's important to keep this in mind because as we look at what Paul says, we understand that what he's doing is he's peeling back the curtain just a little bit so we can see the cosmic drama that unfolds known as the mystery of God's will. I think if someone were to ask you what kind of drama you're part of, especially this week after we just went back to school, right? That word kind of brings to meaning some different perspective for you. You know, the drama of relationships and the drama of um, students trying to find their way in a new school year and the drama of teachers and parents and all the different kinds of dramas that are unfolding. But what I want us to understand, no, what Paul wants us to understand is that beyond what we can see, there's this continuous cosmic drama that's unfolding and that we need to live with that reality in mind. That is what he's talking about here when he talks about the mystery of God's will. What Paul wants us to know is that no matter what kind of drama is unfolding in our life, there's this bigger cosmic drama that we're all part of that we all get the opportunity to play a part in. The biggest drama in our lives is not when our kids push back against our advice. The biggest drama in our lives is not what's unfolded during COVID-19. The biggest drama in our lives is not whatever happens at the grocery store when someone decides to get in the 10 only line with 100 items, even though that drives me crazy. Paul wants us to pull back the cosmic curtain and peer in for just a minute, and it will only take a minute to reorient us. It's especially important for us as we sit here today. God's Word is good for God's people all the time. As we sit here today at the tail end of a pandemic, feeling like people that might not be particularly blessed, Paul wants us to say, no, no, no. Pull back the curtain and look at all these spiritual blessings that I poured out on you, the people that are called by my name. He wants us to know that there's something that's going on that's greater than we can visualize with our human eyes, that we got to use the eyes of our heart and our spirit to see it. We need to see that there's more going on than the small dramas unfolding around us. And the heart of it all is this mystery of God's will. The mystery of God's will is this great blessing that God has revealed to us. It's a key thought into all of Ephesians as we will unpack over the next several weeks. In the Bible, just so that you get this, a mystery is not something that's mysterious or difficult to understand. A mystery is something that's been locked up by God and then is revealed at a specific time for His people to know and to benefit from. It's a truth that He brings to our attention. And the mystery that He says He's opened up here is the mystery of God's will. And let me just give it to you real simply, and then we're going to look at some of the examples of it this morning. The mystery of God's will simply stated is this, that God will gather together and unify all things, Paul says, through God, seen and unseen, in a spirit of peace and harmony. That's the mystery of God's will. That all things will be brought to this peaceful, eternal state in Christ. God is moving through this cosmic drama towards this ultimate end that no matter whether we buy into it or not is ultimately going to happen. So what I say is let's be part of what he's doing. Let's enter into this cosmic drama. Let's not be spectators. Let's let people know that there are unlimited spiritual blessings available to them. Paul's great truth that has been locked up by God up until this moment when he reveals it to Paul and then to us. Is about being unified. And it reveals several things. It reveals God's eternal purpose and plan for the world and that it's God's good pleasure to bring it about. 
He rejoices in bringing about unity. He rejoices in the fact that in Christ that we come together in harmony. And he talks about this very good reality. Paul's great truth, this mystery of God's will. In the backdrop, what we need to understand is that there's a terrible division throughout the universe that was present in Paul's day and in our day. And it doesn't get there by mistake. It gets there by the enemy. The need for God to gather all things to earth indicates that this division will one day be trumped and overdone. When we get to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, it will specifically talk about that. And the fact that God's primary concern through all of the ages has been to harmonize all of His creation into one that sings and brings glory to Him. There will be an ultimate climax to history. Paul talks about it here as the fullness of time. It's this new order that God's creating in which all things come together in oneness in Christ. All things will be brought to this peaceful state. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm dealing with some of the craziness around me, the the drama that's unfolding right in front of me is easier to pay attention to than this great, eternal cosmic drama. Doesn't it help, even briefly, to step back and be reoriented and understand that all of history is in the hands of God? The word that Paul uses for it here is dispensation. The Greek literally means a household arrangement. And I love this. I want you to get this picture in your mind, this word picture. It's the idea that the universe is literally all God's house, and it's all under the management of God. And eventually, He's going to bring it all into harmony. God is handling and planning and arranging and administering and adjusting to bring things to that ultimate climatic conclusion. And as His followers, we get to be part of that plan. A new and perfect and eternal creation established that together, unified in harmony, will praise and honor and bring glory to Him. Revealing this mystery is Paul's aim in these verses. It's why he was so excited. God gave him this revelation that had been locked up for the ages, and He brought it forth to him and now to us. God's purpose is to condense this this timeline that's going to take Who knows how long to unfold and tell us, no, listen, in the fullness of time, I'm going to gather all things to myself and all things in heaven and on earth will worship me in harmony and in unity. And so today, let's just step in and do our part now and not wait. The sign that that unity has been accomplished, that that newly redeemed creation will praise His glory is revealed three times just in those few short verses that we read. In verses 6, 12, and 14, it talks about it. Of course, it is Christ who makes it all possible because it says in verse 9 that all of this happens in Christos, in Christ. And for those who have responded and laid your life down and live your life today in Christ, there's a sign that I hope that you treasure that we read there at the very last verse. God's plan is underway in your life, and you know that by the seal of the Holy Spirit. This unmarred peace, this amazing mystery of God's will, is not yet fully established in this realm. But there is a promise that His participants in Christ are already blessed with a foretaste of all of those spiritual blessings. Let's live that way. A portion of God's plan for cosmic unity literally resides in our own faithfulness to do our part into bringing this about. So how are we as believers, as followers of Christ, to begin experiencing the unity here and now? He helps us with that too by reflecting on the word of truth is what it talks about in verse 13. We've both heard and believed in Hebrew. Truth is this word that's the root for faithfulness, and it 
it's, it's not the same as it is sometimes, I think, for us. In Hebrew, it's not some frozen concept, but it's a way of living. It's an active style of being. Truth as faithfulness is only true when it's acted out. For Christians, for us, faithful acts are always accomplished as we walk in Christos, in Christ. Paul's teaching makes it clear that the Christian experience encompasses all people in all communities. Yes, it was first embodied in the Jewish community, but now it's embraced by the Gentiles, and we are absolutely part of it. Those marked by the Holy Spirit, those in Christ, those who have the pledge of Christ in them, have this plan already at work. It's a tangible down payment that we've already received on this miraculous thing that we're moving towards. Immediately after this, Paul prays continually, says he prays continually for his readers. He asks God for the Holy Spirit to enable them to know the extent of God's blessing on them as believers. I'm going to pray that for us in just a minute. Asking God's Holy Spirit to help us grasp the depths of who we are and whose we are and the plan that we're part of. Let's pray as the worship team comes. Heavenly Fathers, we come this morning. We just thank you so much that we are a people in Christ. We thank you that you've revealed this mystery of your will and that your will is to bring us together, bring everything together, all of your creation into harmony. And Lord, I know... Sometimes in this season, as we look around, it's hard for us to see that eventuality happening. But part of the way that it happens is when your people that are called by your name live that way. And so, Lord, on this day, that for many mark just an absolute horrid act of evilness, let us mark it by being in Christ and by being in harmony with you and your plan and by allowing the power of your Holy Spirit that has sealed us to put our arms around others and be a part of the redemptive work that you're trying to accomplish here in this community. Lord, we thank you today for the way that you empower us. And we are in awe of an awesome God. And we are incredibly thankful that you would allow us to be a small part of your grand plan. And all God's children said. Let's stand again one more time as we sing that song again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
church in Ephesus as our benediction this morning. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know that this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all fullness of God. Go in peace this morning and serve the Lord. Just a quick reminder, if a few of you could help us begin to uh, convert this and get the table set up, we will probably maybe 15 minutes-ish have a time to break bread together. God bless you.